Welcome to Mideast Realities. Today we have a most unusual, most interesting guest. He's Fawaz Turkey, Palestinian writer and author who's lived in America for quite some time, was born in Palestine, left at the age of eight, I believe, Fawaz. Uh, I think the Israelis told you that you had to leave. 1948, a, a lot of people left for a lot of reasons. Some people left because they wanted to escape being caught in the crossfire. Some people left because they were physically evicted, as in the case of the people who came from Lidda and Ramla. And what happened to you and your family? Tell us. What happened to me and my family was in April 1948, uh, there was a lot of fighting going on in, um, in Haifa. That's where I uh, was born. Mm -hmm. And um, my uh, family uh, lived in a certain neighborhood that was uh, being progressively overrun by Jewish forces. And of course, uh, we uh, ran literally for our uh, lives. And uh, all wars create refugees. Uh, and these refugees leave for different reasons, right. essentially to seek refuge. You ended up in a refugee camp outside of Beirut, where you grew up. That's correct. And at some age, uh, you picked up and went to Australia, and then you ended up in the States, and you've done a lot of traveling, been in Europe, and you became a writer. That's right. That pretty much sums it up in about one sentence, yes. And the reason that we're so glad to have you today is one of your, you're one of the most prolific English-language uh, Palestinian writers. You've written three major books. The first one, uh, which someone like myself read in the 70s, which was actually my introduction to the Palestinian cause, The Disinherited, mm -hmm. probably still your most famous book. It is, yes. It's still, it's still uh, in print and it's still being used uh, on campuses uh, around the country as a textbook in Middle Eastern studies, in third world literature and poetics and so on, yes. Then in the 80s you wrote uh, Soul in Exile, uh -huh. I believe, which was sort of a sequel to The Disinherited? Pretty much, uh, you might call it a sequel. I, uh, being a Palestinian writer, uh, who has lived in exile pretty much uh, sh since the age of eight, certainly in Western exile since the age of, uh, since my late teens, let's say. I have had to draw on material from my background, my tragic background as a Palestinian, you see. So clearly most of my writing is preoccupied with trying to deal uh, with the world of exile uh, that we inhabit, the world uh, of uh, the Palestinians who live in refugee camps or Palestinians who live uh, outside the camps but uh, uh, scattered around the world, not just the Arab world, do you think? So you're a man who grew up as a child on the streets of Beirut selling chiclets for a penny. I remember that sequence in your book. Mm -hmm. uh, you've traveled all over the world. You've been involved with the Palestinian cause with the PLO all your life. Mm -hmm. You've been a Palestinian writer, revolutionary, uh, and here uh, we now face a situation where in your latest book, which uh, has just come out, which is Exile's Return, I believe, mm -hmm. um, the unusual thing is that after a lifetime of struggle, <coughs> you are now in opposition to the PLO, in opposition to Chairman Arafat, and uh, feeling, I think, particularly incensed by the agreements that have been made in, the recent, in recent months. Well, you've actually sort of made a few observations here. Uh, first of all, uh, I have always been in opposition uh, to the policies of the PLO. I've always been uh, incensed, to use your term, uh, against the PLO because of its corruption, its ineptitude, its cynicism over the years. Certainly its excesses, certainly it's uh, uh, the waste uh, uh, of uh, the uh, human and financial resources of the Palestinian people. Uh, now, um, uh, this is not uh, new for me. My criticism in my new book, Exile's Return, of the PLO is not something new. I have always been critical uh, of uh, the PLO leadership. I have not really been against uh, the PLO per se. That is the idea of a Palestinian institution that would embody, as an umbrella group, mm -hmm. if you wish, the, uh, and, and formalize uh, the aspirations of the Palestinian people is something I've always been for. We need definitely as, as a people uh, uh, with a movement and a cause uh, uh, for statehood, we do need a, a body, an organization, an institution, and something like the PLO uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as an organization that would represent the aspirations of the Palestinian people is something that is a necessary function of our struggle. 
I have never been against the idea of the PLO. However, I have been against the PLO leadership over the years. This is not something new for me. Well, let's get in to my the writing, point. in my lectures over the years, I have been extremely vocal in my criticism of these people. Let's get to the heart of it. Mm. What's your opinion of what has happened uh, in the last year since the uh, Oslo Agreement, since the Washington Ceremony, since the Cairo Ceremony, and since the takeover of the PLO of Jericho and Gaza? Very briefly, I think there's been uh, a debasement, a cheapening uh, of the Palestinian cause. Uh, uh, they uh, have reduced uh, the Palestinian cause to a fragment uh, and turned it into an insignificant uh, uh, um, uh, problem having to do with uh, civil uh, uh, rights, i.e. the right of the Palestinians in certain parts of Palestine to pick up their garbage and distribute, and, and, uh, distribute their mail and so on and so forth. Uh, I Why did this happen? What conditions within the Palestinian and Arab worlds uh, made this agreement happen? What made it happen? Yes. I think it was an inevitable culmination of the buffoonery uh, of the PLO le leadership of the years. Uh, this is a leadership that has uh, led us from one uh, diplomatic defeat to another, one military disaster to another, one act of social grief uh, to another and um, it was inevitable after they have uh, sapped us of energy, re reduced us to a fragment of our, of our selfhood, that this would come about. The Israelis of course um, pounced on the PLO at a moment when, uh, at a moment of weakness and said, uh, come hither, <laughs> let's, uh, let's see if we can turn you into Miss Meat. So you see this as a surrender of the Palestinian people? Unquestionably as a surrender. Not just a surrender of the rights of the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza, which, by the way, is a mere fragment of Palestinian territory. I mean, it's, uh, it's about 15 or maybe 18 percent of the original uh, uh, territory of, of historic Palestine. But Well, the West Bank hasn't been turned over to the Palestinians. Jericho, uh, Jericho a little dot on the map. But even if you yes. were to include the whole of the West Bank and Gaza, they yeah. represent a mere 18 percent of historic Palestine. But also they have betrayed and reduced to a fragment the rights of four million Palestinian exiles. What? Nobody talks about these people. Well, go ahead. Here's your chance. Nobody talks about the fact that Yasser Arafat and his henchmen, no other word will henchmen? do. Henchmen? No other word will do. I will not use colleagues or whatever. Henchmen is the word that I will use. Now, but you know these people personally. It was just a few years ago the chairman invited you to spend a whole week with him, flying around on his Falcon, going to all his meetings. He, I think he wanted you to write I, a book about the PLO at that yes, time, didn't he? I, I have known Yasser Arafat intimately over the years, and you're correct, yes, a few years back. Uh, I did fly with him uh, for a whole week, day in, day out. He gave me unprecedented access to him in order to write a book about him, i.e., a week in the life of Yasser Arafat. As it turned out, uh, the book didn't pan out because there was not enough material there to warrant writing a book. Well, you couldn't have been going around calling his people henchmen at the time. I don't. No, I didn't call them henchmen <laughs> at the time. I was unquestionably critical of them at the time. Mm -hmm. And they were tolerant of me because uh, they felt I was a Palestinian uh, a writer, poet, artist, uh, and therefore a little bit off. You see? <laughs> and they could put up with someone like me because I'm a little bit crazy, I'm a little bit uh, uh, different. Maybe a little bit independent? A little bit independent. <laughs> and they could put up with one or two people like me around. Well, that's why we're on public access television. Uh, indeed. So, but <laughs> let me go back to the idea of the betrayal of the Palestinians by the PLO. Uh, the betrayal of uh, four million Palestinians in exile. I mean, these people have lived uh, for the last uh, f almost half a century, uh, waiting to have their rights addressed. And Yasser Arafat dropped them like a broken toy, threw them away like a broken toy. There are four times as many Palestinians in exile as there are in the West Bank and Gaza. Nobody talks about them. Why is that? You know what I'm saying? That's because, well, that's because the PLO doesn't exist anymore. Most Americans don't know uh, the details of what you're talking about. You're talking about the Palestinians that live in refugee camps in Jordan and Syria and Lebanon in exile. You're a Palestinian-American. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, no. and Palestinians in Europe and Palestinians in North America, i.e. the states in Canada and South America. Mm -hmm. Now, all these people are people who uh, have rights as well. Rights, indeed, formalized by the United Nations, the rights of repatriation and or compensation, you know? I mean, what about the Israelis? Are they going to give us reparations for all the pain and the suffering they inflicted on us? Four million Palestinians? Huh? They can ask for reparations from the Germans. But we cannot ask for reparations from them. What's going on here? They killed us and massacred us and bombed us and terrorized us over the last half century. And occupied you. And no. occupied us. And I'm talking about the exiles. Right. right. You know? I'm talking about us, the mm -hmm. people who nobody's talking about. You see? What's your vision of what would be a just and a fair settlement? Uh, I think what is going to happen ultimately uh, uh, is the integration of uh, the two peoples of Palestine, Israelis and Palestinians. I think uh, there will be uh, a fusion of these two peoples, a kind of... Um, uh, Blacks and whites, one on top and one as the subclass? No, no. I think uh, what we are going to see in uh, uh, Palestine uh, is um, the uh, integration of Palestine, the return of Palestine to its uh, a holy state, so to speak, where we do not have one people occupying another. Right. Now, are I'm you not talking about what you expect, or are you talking about what you dream about? No, no, no. Because, I mean, let, let's call it straight. We only have a few minutes here on television. The Palestinian people are now in the process of being put on reservations in Bantustan. Yes. Isn't that what this is all about? Yeah, but I don't, think, uh, I don't think the Israelis are going to be able to sustain that for, uh, like, indefinitely, if you wish. I think what is going to happen in the end uh, will be the uh, uh, integration of Palestine into one uh, state. Well, that's uh, maybe a distant future goal. A distant future. That's what I mean. Okay. But uh, in the but what's happening at the moment? What's your vision, Palestinian American, mm -hmm. whose latest book is about your return after 40 years wandering in exile? That's what exile's return is all about. What's your vision of what's happening now? I went back uh, to Palestine about three years ago. My for the first time since being uh, an eight-year-old For the first time yeah. since I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. uh, my intention was to get a feel of the home ground, what I call the home ground. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, walk around towns and cities and villages where uh, Palestinians and only Palestinians <laughs> live. To get a, to get a, a sense of Palestinian peoplehood, if you wish. And to see your own origins. To see you? my own origins. What I saw was intifada or no intifada. What I saw was the people who had been so cowed into submission. The people who suffered pain almost beyond all rational understanding. You know? Uh, this is the case of a people who is simply uh, live in uh, in towns that become that look like ghost towns after like seven o'clock in the evening, because these people uh, prefer to be in their shuttered homes uh, by sunset rather than to be caught by occupation soldiers or by border police, the brutal border police. Yeah. You know, uh, these are. Uh, uh, th this is the case of a people who had lived uh, under occupation for a quarter century and uh, had been subjected to every manner, every shape, every form of uh, suffering by a brutal occupation. You know, we here in the United States have no idea of the degree and the kind of suffering that the Israelis have uh, all these years inflicted on the Palestinians. You know what I'm saying? Well, the irony of the situation is that I'm an American Jew and I've been able to visit Israel and Palestine over a hundred times in the last 15 or 20 years. Yeah. You're a Palestinian American and you've only been able to visit uh, once. Um, but I've seen the occupation. I, I understand what you're saying. The people have been beaten into submission. They've been just beaten down. Um, everything about their society has been destroyed, which is, I think, an explanation for why they ended up with the kind of agreement that they've got. Yes, the Israelis just caught up with the PLO at a time 
uh, when uh, it uh, had become uh, uh, sort of uh, broken down in back and spirit and offered it an agreement uh, to, uh, uh, that would uh, guarantee the perpetuation of occupation in a different form. Tell us about Yasser Arafat. Tell us about what you think about the man and why he has subjugated his people to this kind of an agreement. Well, I mean, look, Yasser Arafat is yet another Arab leader. He's not a revolutionary leader. He doesn't have the uh, um, uh, penetrative uh, grasp uh, of political life uh, that, uh, you know, Castro or Mao Zedong or Lenin or, or Mandela, or Mandela mm -hmm. thank you for reminding me, uh, had. Uh, Yasser Arafat is a simple man bordering on uh, being a simpleton uh, in terms of his grasp. Uh, of the uh, political uh, realities of the world. He's a typical Arab leader. He's a patriarch. He is, he is running, or he used to run, uh, a political organization, the PLO, uh, uh, in, in the same uh, manner that Arab leaders led their governments, led their uh, countries. Putting it in somewhat different language, what you're really saying is that the PLO has become a client regime of the West and of the Israelis just as the regimes in Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Egypt and Morocco and other places are client regimes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not just client regimes. Uh, these are one-man shows. Most of these uh, countries that we call countries in the Arab world are not really countries. Uh, they are artificial creations uh, established there by former colonial overlords. Uh, someone like uh, Churchill in the... In the um, in the heyday of uh, British uh, power, uh, was able to go to, um, uh, to uh, um, our part of the world and say, let there be Jordan. <laughs> and there was a Jordan. You let see? there be Kuwait. And, uh, and they, <laughs> let there be Kuwait. <laughs> right. The French, in like manner, said, let there be Lebanon, and, and so on and so but forth. But it's more than that. It's let there be the Saudi family ruling Saudi Arabia. We, let there be the Hashemite family. Thank Thank right. you. And uh, it's a question of, not only that, but look at it. You mentioned uh, uh, the Saudi family and the Hashimite family. Look at, the, look at how gutsy uh, these families are. Uh, look at Jordan. What is, what, is the, what is the official name of Jordan? The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Right. And look, Saudi Arabia is called this, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is the case of two countries that are named after the names of the ruling families in the manner of medieval fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. The family of Hashem and the family of Saud. You know what I'm saying? It's well, like these are the only two countries in the world uh, uh, that are named in this fashion. So uh, what I was saying to you is that we have uh, these entities, which I don't want to call countries, entities, in our part of the world, carved up by former colonial overlords, um, uh, ruled by uh, uh, individuals, mostly patriarchal individuals or families, uh, that rule uh, by terror and coercion and murder and violence and demand from their uh, uh, citizens, from their people, the people they rule, they demand obedience, uh, orthodoxy and um, uh, and um, a total submission. And this, of course, is the larger context in which the Palestinian question has been dealt with the way it's been dealt with. Because, in a sense, it's the Arab establishment, along with the Americans, along with the Israelis, that wanted this kind of an agreement, that wanted to set up a client regime for the Palestinians. That's absolutely true. I mean, uh, uh, we made a mistake in accepting the PLO rhetoric in the past about uh, its uh, identity as a revolutionary movement. PLO was never a revolutionary movement. PLO was a, uh, another Arab regime ruled by another Arab patriarch demanding from his people submission, orthodoxy, uh, uh, obedience. Well, tell us more about the conditions in Palestine today then, because it's not just the PLO that has political legitimacy there. In fact, uh, I think Hamas probably has more political legitimacy than the PLO does. I don't know why, Mark, you keep saying the PLO. PLO doesn't exist anymore. There is no PLO. I mean, the PLO, if it exists at all, 
it's embodied in the person of Yasser Arafat and a couple of dozen men around him uh, dreaming dreams of glory about uh, going uh, to the West Bank one day and running the autonomy show from Jericho and Gaza. The PLO doesn't exist. Of course it did in the past. It did. And uh, it did represent the Palestinian people, legitimately represent the Palestinian people, because it derived this legitimacy at the time, whether it was patriarchal or not, that's irrelevant. It derived that legitimacy from three sources. It had a, a military uh, force, military power, mm -hmm. you know, the commandos and the, the guerrillas and the militia forces. I think they called them the, the, the terrorists there. Well, they call them terrorists uh, here. Right. Uh, we call them uh, uh, guerrillas or freedom fighters. Okay. You know, Reagan called the uh, Contras freedom fighters, and we call them terrorists. Fair enough. You see? So um, uh, that's another point. The point is, this is one of the reasons that the P one of the sources right. uh, of legitimacy uh, of the PLO at the time, uh, namely the power profile it projected through its military forces, uh, another uh, uh, source of legitimacy, of course, for the PLO was the fact that it had all these institutions that actually helped Palestinians, or some Palestinians. Mm -hmm. You know, it had um, medical and educational institutions. It had institutions that uh, uh, opened schools, orphanages. Uh, it had economic institutions uh, that gave gainful employment to uh, Palestinian refugees. Plus, of course, it had political institutions uh, that enabled uh, many Palestinians to speak up without fear of having their heads cracked and, and their voices silenced or whatever. Um, the most uh, important uh, of these institutions, of course, was the Palestine National Council, the legislative uh, body of the Palestinians that had brought uh, together uh, Palestinians of all stripes, you know, from all stratification of class in our society. And finally, there was a time actually when, uh, yet another reason as to why the PLO um, was legitimately uh, in existence as a representative of the Palestinians, was the fact that the overwhelming majority of Palestinians supported the PLO. Mm -hmm. But now all of these uh, three reasons no longer exist. The commandos or the guerrillas have gone. You well, may they're recall now, they're now called police forces, aren't they? Uh, no, not to. You see, in 1982, all the Palestinian guerrillas in Lebanon were expelled, and they went and they they were right. sent to Algeria, uh, Yemen, uh, Sudan, and so on, and so on. In the interim, of course, uh, virtually 95 percent of these uh, guerrillas had either found gainful employment in the Gulf countries or returned uh, to their host states to rejoin their families. Mm -hmm. And, uh, not to so, mention they got older. Uh, not <laughs> to mention they got older, yes, since okay. 1982. Uh, and the institutions have collapsed. The institutions that gave legitimacy to the PLO, that I mentioned earlier, have totally collapsed. Why did they collapse? They began to collapse soon after the Gulf War when the PLO began, very simply, to go broke. <laughs> Mm -hmm. These institutions no longer exist. Well, yes, but Yasser had squandered so many millions of dollars prior to that. I mean, there was so much money that had been pumped into the PLO. Look, uh, there was a time when, according to some uh, estimates I came across, reliable estimates, uh, that, that the PLO controlled anything between uh, 20 and 40 billion dollars a year. Billion? Yes, sir. Billion with a B. I mean, the magnitude of corruption, nepotism, uh, incompetence, we all knew that uh, for a long time. Mark, uh, let, me, let me tell you this, and please quote me on that. <laughs> uh, uh, as you know, uh, I have been intimately connected with the PLO over the years, and I, I know most of the uh, top henchmen in the PLO, again that word. Uh, and I can tell you, I have seen with my own eyes, I have seen PLO officials walking around with Samsonites full of $100, bundles of $100 bills. I have seen PLO officials squander tens of thousands of dollars on their own personal expenses. But also, let's be clear, you're saying the PLO has been defeated, the Palestinian people are, are completely divided. The agreement is, is leading to nothing. I mean, you, you don't even want to talk about it. I think you're so alienated from it, you don't even want to talk about the agreement. It's, it's so trivial. I don't think it's worth talking about. 
Well, it's, it's hardly so, trivial. Gone with it's, the it's defining the, mm. the new nature of the Middle East. It's not defining new anything. You know, history has its own laws. You really think this is a very transient arrangement, a temporary arrangement? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, keep in mind that what happens in Palestine, including Israel, uh, is linked inextricably to the ebb and flow of political life in the region, which in turn is affected by what happens in the global dialogue of cultures, you know? So Palestine is a subsystem uh, uh, of a bigger system uh, around it, you know? And I really believe, uh, should there be dramatic uh, transformations uh, in the region, this will also affect uh, the situation in Palestine. And I definitely, most decidedly uh, believe uh, that this is not an agreement uh, that represents a terminus of our rights. No way. No way. What about us? I am not happy with the situation. I mean, if the Palestinians uh, in the West Bank and Gaza ultimately uh, get to establish their own state, which I find uh, to be almost virtually impossible, you know, um, I'll be happy for them. But hey, what about us, man? What about us Palestinians who uh, were kicked out of Palestine? And I mean kicked out of Palestine or terrorized into fleeing Palestine. We have no rights. I say to you, we have rights, and we are going to get together soon, and we are going to uh, say to the world, hey, you've forgotten us, huh?